Stephanie would have had a lot more insights from the Stamen side. So I'm just trying to channel her her knowledge and, and give it to you today. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited to talk about the project that was really a lot of my summer. Um, and just a quick intro into what what Stamen and Stady are, and then we'll get into what the Stamen map tiles are and what they what are they are becoming. So most of you probably have heard of Stamen Design. Um, they've been around since 2001. Um, really, when I think about Stamen, I look at all the projects that have used OpenStreetMap in the last 10 to 20 years, and you can probably find Stamen's fingerprints somewhere in there. Um, if you look at their client list, the companies who have recently released OpenStreetMap based base maps, um, Meta, AWS, Apple, et cetera, there's, that's who their clients are. They also work with a lot of um, journalism. Uh, they do a lot of data visualization. Um, they've worked with the Dalai Lama. Um, they're all over the place when it comes to OpenStreetMap and data visualization. And then my company, Stadia Maps, um, we do location APIs for developers. Um, anything from map tiles to geocoding and uh, satellite maps. And we basically have three reasons you'd want to choose us over many of the competitors. Um, we're private, affordable, and supported. We've been around for the, the last seven years, um, so not super new, but also not super old. And we really are excited about this opportunity to work with Stamen. Um, Many of you probably already know the Stamen map tiles, but if you don't, um, you probably have seen Stamen watercolor. Uh, it's probably the most iconic design using OpenStreetMap data that I've seen. I remember when probably 15 years ago when I had my first laptop, I had a desktop background that was Stamen watercolor, and I didn't even know that maybe one day I'd be part of it. Um, and then there's also two other primary styles. There's Stamen Toner up in the upper right there and Stamen Terrain, um, which adds a bit more topography and such. Um, so these are the, the styles that were designed um, about 10 years ago, actually 12 years ago. Um, they were created based on a grant by the Knight Foundation. So the Knight Foundation is a um, foundation that came out of two um, newspaper um, owners. Uh, they basically created a foundation to support democracy and journalism, free journalism in the world. And that foundation was doing a lot with maps. They talked to Stamen and said, can you create us a set of map styles that will allow us to create journalistic work, whatever you would need in a newspaper or an online site. And that's kind of the impetus for creating the, the original styles. And since then, they have kind of become the de facto style to use if you just want free map tiles. Um, they have been used in tens and probably hundreds of thousands of projects. They're the default in a lot of open source projects. And as you'll see later, this actually is slightly problematic for us as we're trying to, to make changes. Um, but really, a lot of times, the Stamen map tiles were just the default. Um, so pretty much everyone has seen them if they've seen an online map. Something really cool about the watercolor style is it's not just a utilitarian map. It's also a beautiful piece of art. And it was, created, it was actually moved into the Smithsonian's permanent collection um, a couple years ago and actually there's a, there's a website with the statement map tiles hosted, um, the, the, the watercolor style hosted. And I think they're actually running the full servers and all that. And if you're interested in that whole process, there's actually a really interesting podcast that was recorded with one of the curators talking about how you actually curate something like a map and keep it in as part of a, a digital art collection. But when you're talking about a set of maps, which has essentially become a art piece. Um, it, it has a few problems with it um, as, a, as an online map tile service. So why did we make, need to make any change at all? I mean, everyone likes the tiles. They've been there. They're free. What, what could possibly be the problem? Um, and 
one of the big problems is actually missing tiles. Uh, so because of the cost of running tile servers, I don't know how many of you have run tile servers, but they can be quite costly. Um, Stamen actually had to turn off the tile servers a few years ago and running off just the cache. So if you zoom in too far in particular areas of the world, there's just missing tiles. Um, and then that is complicated by the fact that there's also old data. Uh, most of the, the data that was being served was from no earlier, th no later than five years ago. I think most of it was about 10 years old at this point. So slowly, ever so slowly, the utility of the map just became less and less. There was missing data, wrong data. Um, you can really see when you look at the old and the new just how much OpenStreetMap has evolved in the last 10 years, how much data is there now. Um, but then, of course, people want an updated map. But fundamentally, the problem was it cost a lot. Um, because the tile set is so popular, um, terabytes of data a month, millions of requests um, on any CDN, that costs you quite a lot of money, um, thousands of dollars a month. And essentially, Stamen was subsidizing many, many, many institutions around the world, um, companies, and not really driving any revenue. And they, they didn't have a way to do that. And so they needed to make a change. Fundamentally, they couldn't keep doing that. And they are a company that works with clients. They sign contracts and they work on a client project with, with some big company. They don't have a customer support team. So anytime they would get inquiries, they really couldn't address them. And they wanted to see a solution where those questions could actually be addressed. And that's how we got to the partnership. Um, early in the summer, um, Stephanie May, who was, was supposed to be here, reached out to me. We had a call and we started talking about what would it look like if the Stamen map tiles moved to Stadium Maps. Um, this is kind of what we do. We started with a map tile service seven years ago. Um, we have all the things you need to do authentication, to do usage tracking and all that. And we really love open source and at least Personally, we have loved the Stamen map tiles since the beginning. Um, it's a bit of a, a dream come true of mine to be able to work directly with these styles. So fast forward over the course of the summer, and we ended up creating brand new Stamen map tiles. The toner and terrain were completely redone, um, and watercolor is imported into our system. We're, we're looking at, to see if we can actually recreate that as well with new data. Um, it's almost entirely open. Um, all the data is from open sources, um, obviously OpenStreetMap and Natural Earth. And then we also pulled in the EU land cover data set, uh, vectorized it, and that's how we get the global um, land cover. And this is actually a really fun problem that we had to solve in the cartography side. And Stamen loves a um, Easter egg. And so there's a little hand-drawn Null Island. If you, if you zoom in on the zero, zero coordinate, eventually you get to Null Island. It's a completely open stack. The base data is open map tiles, which is we, we forked a while ago. And we actually have some of our own modifications to that. Map Libre is the renderer, both for raster tiles and for a vector set. And there's plenty of open source glue in between. There's our own tile server. There's some other open source projects. And yeah, but if you have Map Libre and you have vector tiles that match the open map tiles schema, you can get pretty close to using those styles on your own system. We also, it's entirely open license. Um, the styles themselves are just CC BY, so you can recreate a very similar style using just attribution. Um, right now, the styles themselves, I have a typo in there that should be CC BY NC, um, is currently non-commercial. Uh, just for the first couple of years, we want to open that up fully. Um, but at, at the moment, to recoup some of our investment, that, that style is going the style sheets themselves are, are not for commercial use outside of our system. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of the challenges and successes we saw building this tile set. Now, when you imagine a tile set that was created 10 years ago, um, it's been used by thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. None of them had to sign up for anything. Um, so the styles are old. We, don't know, we can't communicate with lots of users. We don't want users' maps to break. Um, 
there were a lot of problems we had to solve really at the beginning that weren't even technical, and then a lot of technical and even cartographic problems along the way. Let's start with like the organizational and communication challenges. These kind of surprised me, to be honest. Um, how do you go about informing hundreds of thousands of users that your maps are going to break when you don't have their email address? They didn't register anywhere. All you have is maybe a referrer for a website. And this is one of the first problems we looked at because we knew that if we wanted to create a, a commercial service, we wanted to um, give people the option to pay for this to, to keep it working, um, then we had to let them know somehow. So of course you can write blog posts, but that doesn't mean people are going to read them. You can post to social media all day long, but it doesn't mean the right people will see it. So we kind of developed a, a plan, a multi-step plan. Um, first, of course, Stamen and Stadia, we both wrote blog posts. We spread it as wide as possible. And that probably got the first 25% of people aware of what was happening. And then we, needed a way to actually break it without breaking the map fully. Um, so we developed a solution where we actually started replacing tiles with an info tile. So one map tile would load the right map tile, and then the next one would load a tile that said, go to stamen.com slash FAQ, I think is what the, the URL was. But to basically say, this is changing. Your map's not completely breaking yet. Um, but you need to go make a change. And of course, Stamen is all about open data and open source. We're all about open data and open source. How, and we wanted to do this in a, in a way that respected the users. So how do we take this free product and turn it into a commercial product without also making all the users unhappy? And the first thing we knew we had to do was communicate why this was even necessary. And this it comes down to cost, it comes down to complexity, it comes down to the fact that it wasn't supported. Um, so we tried to over-communicate both the reasons why we were doing it and the necessity for the change. Um, and then from the Stadia side, we've always had a free tier. And so we had to make sure that stayed that way. Um, another thing we did is we made this transition period as as long as possible. We were actually serving 100% of the, the stamen traffic um, from, the big, from like July on. So we actually had three months of like absorbing that entire traffic load before we made people um, sign up. Um, and I, I think this actually ended up working. Um, we have had a few people complain, but it's mostly been positive and, and an understanding from the community, uh, which is, to me, one of the biggest successes of the project. But this is also embedded in tons of open source. So imagine you have a plugin like Leaflet Providers where they have 100, 100 different tile sources. Um, and there's probably 20 of those packages out there that are very similar for different, different platforms. So one of the first things we started to do after we developed a plan for communication was how do we start working with open source developers to make the change? Um, and this also went pretty well. I was actually quite surprised how quickly open source moved to adopt the new URLs to actually accept the change. Um, but this was also one of the biggest sources of support requests that we had. There were a few packages that lagged and still like even now haven't fully updated. So, so users will reach out and say, why are my maps broken? And there's really nothing we can do other than say, you can use our forked version. So we actually forked a few projects to, to update the um, URLs. We opened lots of PRs. And overall, I would say that given the, the, the scale, it actually went pretty well. And then of course, we didn't want to make the community mad at us. Um, the whole point was to make something that was better. You might have to pay for it, but it is net better. And this really, it's not really a new question compared to the others. It, it really came down to being open and transparent about why we had to make a change, why Stamen had to make a change, why we were a good host for it. And um, 
overall, like I said, it seemed to go pretty well. But I didn't know any of these questions would be a problem before we got into the project. I thought it was going to be a technical problem. And really, we spent probably 40% of the time in meetings trying to figure out how do we communicate this change. Um, so if you run something for free and you change it to something that's paid, expect to answer some of the same questions. Some of the fun technical challenges. So uh, with success comes problems. Um, this graph is a graph of our tile loads, our, our raster tile loads, from before we onboarded the stamen usage to after. And I don't know how well you can see it, but that's about a 2.5x increase in traffic, basically overnight. And um, that was, I think, it, and that's measured in thousands of requests. Um, I don't remember what the exact numbers are. Um, but we had to absorb this during the, the, the uh, crossover period. Uh, so what we ended up doing is we run our own CDN. We have for the last five, six years. We started beefing up servers kind of in advance. Um, we increased the cache sizes quite a bit. And we in, ended up able to absorb it without too much trouble. Um, most of this was actually going back to an S3 bucket. So we had our CDN. It was just talking to an S3 bucket, caching it on the edge. And overall, it, it worked pretty well. Um, and you can see that sometimes these tiles got really, really popular, where it, the spikes were actually 4 or 5x. Um, we had fun things like cron jobs that ran on the hour and downloaded at 500, 600 requests a second from one IP. Um, we thought about dealing with it, but eventually it went away. It's, the problem solved itself. Um, but there was lots of tricks that we had up our sleeve if it kept going. So the first challenge was just absorbing this immense amount of traffic. And then the second challenge was there's three tile sets that we talk about. There's, there's watercolor, there's toner, and there's terrain. But when you break it down, there was actually like 15 different variants. Um, you can see kind of a matrix here of toner and toner light, which are two separate styles. And then you have like the ones with labels, with um, lines, without them, just the background. And I don't know how much you know about rendering raster tiles in MapLibre, but basically your memory usage is a function of how many styles you have running. So if we wanted to render something like 10 to 15 styles simultaneously on the fly, which is what we do, um, we had to solve the memory problem. Um, our internal systems right now, I think we have five styles. So we were going to have to do 3x that um, just to run the stamen uh, stack. And what we ended up doing is first we cut a few of the styles. Um, there were lots of different combinations. And we ended up with about, I think it's eight different styles now um, within those, those three tile sets. And we also made significant technical um, improvements in the MapLibre stack to reduce the memory usage in our tile server. Um, this was the thing that kept me up at night for <laughs> about three weeks trying to solve the memory problem because we were having stability issues because tile servers kept running out of memory. Um, and when we solved it, um, it felt like the project was was going to be successful. And this was a really fascinating decision that was made 10 years ago that really made this whole process difficult. Um, so the statement map tiles were previously hosted on an S3 bucket and then served with a Fastly CDN. When they started, they were served on, I think, something like maps.statement.com with a, a tile URL, and everyone used that. But this was before the era of everything being secure traffic. And when they wanted to implement SSL, the decision was made, well, we won't create a certificate for maps.statement.com because that's complicated. So they just used a Fastly URL. So this is actually under uh, like a Fastly domain. And as a result, one, there was two different sets of tile URLs being used. So that's complicated enough. But the second problem is we don't control the Fastly domain. So if we want to change where these tiles are being loaded from, we have to actually make the users make a change. Um, and as most of you probably know, it's very difficult to get people to do anything until it actually breaks. So we spent quite a bit of time finding a solution where 
we could serve the traffic on the Fastly domains as long as possible, while also redirecting the old URLs for the insecure traffic. We ended up coming up with a solution where on the Fastly CDN, we redirected all the tiles to the, the Stadia URLs. And over time, um, we eventually just turned off the Fastly domain, and then all those maps stopped working, and we couldn't even inform them of why they were stopped working. So unfortunately, we probably lost quite a few potential customers simply because we didn't control the domain that it was being hosted on, and there was no way to reduce the number of requests being made. Um, so that was a lesson learned. If you ever have multiple domains and, and a lot of traffic on a domain you don't control and you need to make a change, it's going to create pain down the road. So don't do that. Another interesting technical challenge was with especially the train tile set. Um, it, I'll talk about this a little bit more in depth later, um, but it needs like four or five different input data tile sets to actually render a single tile. Um, on the client, it loads all this. When you're doing map libre, it loads it all um, live. But on the server, it needs to get all these t inputs before it can even start rendering. Um, I think it's four or five different input tile sets. And so we, what we ended up doing here is because we need as high concurrency as possible, we need as low latency as possible is in our tile server, we ended up creating a mechanism where it would read the style and understand exactly what tiles were needed to be loaded um, before it rendered the, the raster tile. And it went and, um, went and made those requests before it even started trying to render. Um, so it would hold it in memory and then serve it directly to the MapLibre backend that does the raster rendering. Um, and that ended up working really well. Um, but Terrain needs lots of inputs. We built a mechanism to load all those inputs before we even tried to start rendering the tile. And that was able, basically able, allowed us to push all that latency outside the rendering process. Because normally, if you're using like a MapLibre a stack, it's going to try to load all the inputs inside the tile render process. So it like blocks the entire render thread for the entire render process. Um, and let's say we're pulling some tiles from some object storage somewhere like S3 and we're pulling others from somewhere else, and it takes 50, 100 milliseconds to load all these tiles into place, and that's 100 milliseconds where we could have been rendering some other tile, um, and at thousands of requests a second, that makes a big difference. And like I said, Stamen likes Easter eggs. Well, if you want to render Null Island, you, you need to have a geometry. You need to have this polygon somewhere. Um, and it wasn't particularly simple either. It was like a, a nice, fun little island. I'll show it to you later. But we don't want to put this in our vector tiles because we don't want everyone to see Naw Island. We don't have the Easter egg in our base maps. That could be quite interesting. Um, so we needed a way to like inject Naw Island into our vector tiles. And we thought about it quite a bit. And we ended up creating just a separate vector tile set entirely just for Naw Island. Uh, we tried GeoJSON based in actually embedded in the map Libre style spec, but that was like, I think an extra 50 kilobytes and we didn't want to make every single user download an extra 50 kilobytes just for a little Easter egg. Um, so we ended up having an se entirely separate tile set. So if any of you ever want to render Null Island, we have something. <laughs> Maybe we should document it somewhere. And like I was talking about with Terrain, um, it needs four separate input tile sets, open map tiles, vector to set, the global land cover. Um, and this is actually a tile set we had to create for this project. Um, i had been looking at it for a long time, but we never had the, the chance to actually do it. Um, so if you don't know anything about this tile, this um, data set, it's actually really cool. Um, the EU has created a, I think it's 10 meter resolution um, land cover set for the world um, in raster format. Um, they classify it into something like 10 to 12 different classifications, forest, woods, or forest, um, meadows, crops, urban, ice, et cetera, all these different types of land cover. And we were able to take that, reduce it, uh, simplify it a little bit, convert it to vector um, using open source tools, GDAL and such, and have a really good global land cover. Um, we want to add another version. We want to simplify it a little bit more, make it a little bit nicer. Um, but this was 
one of the pieces we needed to make the terrain tile set work. And then elevation. Um, so terrain also in, includes topology and hill shading. So we needed to bring this in as terrarium tile sets. So we're actually using the maps in created terrarium set. Um, anyone can get access to it on S3, uh, but that's the where we get the hill shading from. And like I said, we needed an all island. Um, so if you want an all island, come talk to us. And this is where it got interesting, and this is the part where I really wish Stephanie were here because she could give all the the details of of what it took to create um, these recreate these tile sets using a completely new stack. As you can imagine, um, before I think they were Mapnix styles based on a Postgres database, um, a very different method of rendering maps. Ten years ago, it was state of the art. Today, not so much. Um, and so there were a few different. Um, pieces of the puzzle that were really hard to figure out. Um, with terrain, uh, when you're zoomed way out, and there's going to be some more images later, um, you want to have like an understanding of the entire global land cover. But when you zoom in, you suddenly get the actual land cover in OpenStreetMap, because OpenStreetMap has forests and, and all these other types of land cover. So we needed a way to use both but then make the transition smooth because obviously coming from two different data sets, you're going to have slightly different uh, polygons. And it was quite tricky. Uh, so what we ended up doing is you can see here on the left, there was an early draft where you have basically conflicts between, um, like I think here in the, there's an edge here. Um, you can see in the back here, there's the um, global set. And then kind of the, the front stuff, the little or patches, is from OpenStreetMap. And so it doesn't really work well together. Um, so what they ended up doing is creating this blur effect um, where you see more in the middle, where you can start to see that the, the regional ones at this kind of zoom level are a lot lighter. And then as you zoom in, it's actually going to get um, a lot more prominent the the local sets, and then the global set will kind of fade out. Um, there's more images. Let's see if I can find them. Yeah, here we go. So you can start to see kind of how this works together. Um, on the left, again, you have kind of the bad mix and match. And then in the center, you see how it kind of works together eventually. Another thing I never thought I'd have to deal with is font licensing. Um, so. Helvetica is a state of mind. Um, I love the, the font face. Um, Stamen loves it. And we would have loved to use it in the tile sets. Come to find out, we weren't even using it in the old tile sets, but um, that's, that's a historical artifact. They thought they were using Helvetica. Um, but I remember sitting in a meeting, we were talking about this, and I said, what about a license? Don't we have to license Helvetica? And they were like, yeah, I think we do. And so we, I went to go look for how do you license a, a font for a map? And you go to all these different websites and you find, oh, you can license it for one printout. You can license it for a logo. You can license it for X number of web views. And you look at the pricing and it's like $10,000 for 300,000 web views. And you're like, well, that's not going to work. Um, so I actually looked quite long and quite hard, and there was just no platform that would allow us to license fonts without going in and saying, here's exactly what we want to do and getting probably a tens or hundreds of thousands of dollar quote back for using it in a map. So we found an alternative. Um, we found Enter. Um, it's open licensed, and you can find it on Google Fonts pretty much anywhere, and replaced the, what we thought was Helvetica was actual Arial, we replaced it all with Enter. Um, so another piece of open source winning in the end, simply because you can't even pay for something you kind of wanted to pay for. Then, of course, updating the styles, um, we were going from two very different schemas. Uh, we use open map tiles, or an open map tiles derivative. 
And then I don't honestly know what they were using back in the day, 10, 12 years ago, but I assume it was some kind of OSM to PG SQL schema that was imported. And there are certain disadvantages that come with the open map files schema. It's something, a lot of things we know about and we want to improve, but it's often quite difficult. Um, one of these things is relative prominence. Um, so when you're dealing with vector tile based styles, you only know the data like in the immediate vicinity. You like know the tile you loaded and nothing else around it. So let's say you want to display the most prominent peak in a country. Um, at low zooms, it works because you have the whole country in the tile. As you zoom in, it becomes much, much more difficult. Um, these are problems. This particular problem is one we're still working on. We're trying to figure out what's the best way to do relative classification across a large area while still doing it in vector tiles. Um, there's also issues with um, like airport and road classification. Quite sometimes with the style, you'll have like this little stretch of road that's classified as a major highway, and then there's no connecting roads, and it's you get like this splotchy road network on the map. Um, but see if I can find an example here, um, I don't think I can quickly, but. There's lots of these little classification issues that we really want to fix, um, but it's kind of for work in progress. So what you all really just wanted to see was the before and after. Um, so we have terrain here. Um, on the left is the before, and on the right is the after for all these pictures. Um, one of the things you can see here is just the li little extra depth of color we got in the land cover, which I really, really like. On the left, you have it's a little bit more washed out, but on the right, with adding that global uh, land cover set underneath all the OSM data, we actually got this like nice foundation of land cover in addition to um, really sharp hill shading. But again, there's there's not it, it's a very true to the original styles um, transition. Um, there's not that huge difference. You can actually see down in the lower right of terrain there, you have like this light blue or almost aqua. And that's just coming in from the additional land covers we brought in from the global, uh, which is really cool to see this additional differentiation. In the mountains, again, a little bit more depth, a little bit more clarity and sharpness. Um, nothing too much more to mention there. And what was really cool is with the toner tile set, often you look at the two tile sets and you don't even notice a difference. Um, if you put it, if you had it without it being side by side, a lot of people would not even notice that there's a significant difference. Um, again, more toner uh, adjustments. I think this is New York City. Um, you can start to see kind of how much more data is available. Um, if you look in, for instance, here, there's a lot more buildings in the data set than there was. Um, but again, most of the, the, the style itself has not changed significantly. Toner light before and after. Again, not, not a significant difference. And this is just the beginning. Um, both Stamen and, and Stadia entered this for a long-term partnership, and we want to see what cool things we can create with OpenStreetMap data in the future. Um, we've done a lot of the hard work doing the initial style transition. Um, but one thing that was left out this entire time was watercolor, and there's a reason for that. Um, if you look at the way watercolor works, it's a lot of really cool textures and some Gaussian blurs and such applied on top. And it's literally impossible to create with current vector style renderers. Uh, so MapLibre can't do it right now. But with recent work in MapLibre native, um, there's actually the possibility to introduce custom shaders. And we are hoping that, that one day we'll be able to recreate watercolor using up-to-date data. And MapLibre using a custom shader, um, time will tell. 
but we're hoping for that. Um, there's a lot more optimization we can actually do to the styles themselves now that we've made the transition. We can start working on the schema to improve things like classifications and relative priority. And we want to keep doing that over the next um, few years. And at the end of the day, we now have a Stamen map tiles uh, tile set that is up to date. Um, we update the data every month. So if it's in OpenStreetMap, it's going to be there very soon. Um, it's supported. We, we have a team to, to make sure that your questions are answered. And it should live on for a very long time in the future. Thank you. OK, thank you, Luke. And do we have any questions at all for Luke? Yeah, done, huh? Uh, so you obviously care a lot about the cartography and the level of detail. And you do the before and after. Did any of the hopefully new customers notice any errors? Like this is this is off. You should improve this. I don't think anyone reported errors. We actually made a few people mad because the states, like the U.S. states in the old styles, were abbreviations. They were like two-letter codes, and in the new styles, they're the full name. And there was a few websites that were using the two-letter codes because that's the only style set they could find with that. <laughs> but other than that. I, I haven't heard any, I don't think most people noticed, honestly. I think a lot of times, unless you have a trained map, uh, you're not even going to notice the difference. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, because at the start, you were talking about how you had watercolor maps that Stamen designed on your laptop and didn't know. And you said a lot of people were probably using these um, without kind of realizing or thinking about Stamen. Do you think that's maybe will change or has changed now and people will think more where the maps come from when they see them in an application? Yeah, I hope so. I think that there's, I mean, it's certainly now you have to sign up somewhere, so you can't just use the tile set without any kind of registration. Um, but I think it's also cool that you do have to think about the maps a little bit. Um, it should be more than just a little attribution down in the right-hand corner of, yes, this came from somewhere. There's a lot of work that go into maps, both from, obviously, data collection, um, everyone who's a mapper knows how that works, to all the technology between the data collection and actually seeing a map on the internet. So hopefully, um, people will pay attention to, to where the maps come from and, and, and how they're made. Yeah, and that's them changing. Any other questions? We've got one down here. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, Yesterday, in another talk, the land cover also came up about the, the um, walking routes through the mountains, then in Italy. Uh, do you have any recommendations for like OpenStreetMap tagging or uh, how, how can we improve this? Um, is it detailedness or? From a cartographic standpoint, like if you want something that looks good, the trouble with OpenStreetMap data is it's too good. It's too precise. Um, when you kind of zoom out, you need a lot of simplification and generalization that's not easy to do automatically from the OpenStreetMap data set. Um, you actually want something very coarse grained when you're at like Z0. Um, so honestly, I, I thought about this question because I was thinking, well, maybe we can create a global land cover from OpenStreetMap. And I started looking at it, and sure, you could, but I don't think that's the problem you're trying to solve. Um, so in my mind, it's actually, it's fine. We have two different data sets. Um, these data sets don't change that often. Land cover moves, you know, maybe it's a couple percent a year at max. Um, so having these satellite data um, driven global data sets, and then you zoom in and have the precise boundaries for the, the forests and the fields and such, I think is actually a really good um, mix of data. And obviously, we are able to get a good effect here with it. And I think that anyone who wants to create maps using open data now has a, a solution to kind of solve both problems. OK. Any, we'll take one more question or not? No. Um, well, thank you again, Luke. <laughs>